Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. Today is uh, January 8th, 2023, which is the podcast for the baptism of our Lord. Our first reading is from Isaiah 42, uh, verses 1 through 9. The psalm is uh, the 29th psalm. Our second reading is from Acts chapter 10, verses 34 through 43. And our gospel is Matthew chapter 3, verses 13 through 17. We'll note that uh, Epiphany is, uh, was um, January 6th, and uh, we have a separate podcast for that. Uh, so for those of you who uh, would like to just set the season of Epiphany, we invite you to uh, go back and take a look at that. Um, or listen to that, uh, whichever mode you're in. But before we begin, I have to say we are going to wish Matt a happy birthday. Happy birthday, Dr. Matt Skinner, Reverend Dr. Matt Skinner. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> I get overshadowed January. by Elvis Presley and David Bowie on January 8th, but it's also my birthday. So, Well, I get overshadowed by Jesus, so there's that. <laughs> Hold on to your stuff, folks. Yeah. <laughs> I guess I get overshadowed by St. Patrick, but not exactly. Yeah. You guys are right on that. <laughs> well, that's because I'm not so. Shall we move into uh, taking a look at uh, Matthew? Uh, yeah. And then the overall, the overall day, of course, of baptism of our Lord. And we have historically mentioned, and I will again, that one of the challenges, and I've been thinking about this a lot more because I was working with a, a student a couple of weeks ago and she had to preach on Christ the King and and she was just really struggling with it because she's like, well, how do I talk about Christ the King? And there's so many things to say. And where did that, where did that come from? And what does it mean to, you know, reign of Christ and all of that? And I said, you know, our our trick when it comes to festival days is to not necessarily start with the day, but start with the text and what what specificity or particularity does the does the passage itself offer to thinking about the day. So rather than preaching, a, you know, an entire sermon on baptism and what it means in your tradition or your denomination, what is it about each of these passages, each of these texts uh, on their own? What what insight might they provide for thinking about baptism in a new way or affirming a particular belief about what baptism is in your tradition, but, but imagining uh, like a kaleidoscope and, you know, it's through this particular lens of this text that now you, there are aspects about baptism that perhaps you hadn't thought about before or connections that you've made. So that, that I, like I said, we always, we say that every year, but it's just a reminder that, that when we have a day like this to start with the text and how is this, what, what, what's coming to the surface in this text about a, an aspect of baptism that you think your people would appreciate hearing or need to hear. At the same time, I worry that, that um, I worry about turning to this text or to the story of Jesus baptism to understand our own baptisms. No, I don't mean that. Okay. Yeah. No. This is what happens. It's what happens sometimes when you look at this and think, mm -mm. what's this supposed to be about? No, I don't mean that. I mean, okay, so I'll give you an example. What I mean is that here's this passage according, here's Jesus' baptism according to uh, to Matthew. And what really struck me about uh, about this text that I hadn't really, I mean, I've I've made those connections before, but not not really uh, in a in such a, a significant way is that the, you know, the presence of the spirit, he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove. Um, so that the spirit in Matthew is in, uh, obviously involved in creation. So you've got the dove and creation and that the spirit is involved in conception of, of, of Jesus with Mary back in chapter one. And so all of a sudden I had this sense of, 
Oh, yeah, that baptism is about new creation, that baptism, as I think about what does baptism mean for me, uh, that being uh, having like a new creation or even like being reborn. Uh, and so the way in which these, you know, these images or this image of the spirit and the dove uh, caused me to think along those lines about what does what does what do I think about when I think about baptism? That's what I mean. Yeah, I appreciate that um, per, uh, specific example and focus on the spirit. Um, and, and Matt, your your question, uh, again, leading with the text, uh, as Caroline said, um, I just take a look. Uh, I was struck this time by, um, we often think of baptism as uh, finally the persons that were, that we've judged as needing this truth have finally seen the light and now we're going to, you know, clean them up. And if we start with the text, John says, I shouldn't be baptizing you. You don't need this. And, and so it's a complete, almost reversal of the way if we start with what ba our baptism means. So I really appreciate your caution for us, Matt. And I think that starting with the text, as Caroline has said, is precisely the way to shift the imagination of uh, our, for those who are listening to our sermons, to shift their imagination, to see this event as the seed that makes our baptism uh, a, a significant moment. It, it's, it's setting up that. So my hope would be that there would be baptisms multiple times during the year, but using this story to plant a seed of what does the baptism of Jesus mean that we would say, this is what we want to do. And there's more to that story because we get that in Paul's letters where uh, he talks about what baptism means in terms of bringing folks in. So it's not a one-shot deal. Um, and um, but So I appreciate the, the caution that you've led us to and want to reiterate that starting with the text and letting the text speak on its own shifts the imaginations for our listeners if we're willing to do that in our sermons. Yeah, I think it's worth reminding folks as well that, uh, well, Matthew doesn't tell us, some other gospels we, we anticipate about 30 years have passed <laughs> since mm -hmm. since Jesus was born and the, the, the testing in the wilderness, which comes right before this and then and then this and in no gospel save for a couple of verses in Luke do we know anything about what happens <laughs> between the birth or in Matthew's case the visit of the magi and and this event and of course we all want to know did Jesus know he was the messiah well, you know what was he thinking what happened to the magnificat didn't i thought and the benedictus in Luke doesn't everybody know who he is and it's just not a question the gospel authors are interested in. And so that I think is useful. If I were preaching, I would spend time on that because then you can get at the question, what's this pressing question of epiphany? Like what did we talk about in our last podcast, right? How is this good news of the birth of the King of Jews going to be manifested to the whole world and benefit the whole world? And so far for 30 years, the answer has been, I don't know, <laughs> or at least wait and see or whatever. But now it comes out because the spirit comes to Jesus at his baptism. And so this is the launch of the ministry. The, how is the good news of the birth of the Christ going to be spread? He himself is going to do it in the power of the Holy Spirit. It doesn't just mean he's going to have a loud voice or have really good ideas. It means the power of God for the sake of the reign of God is going to be manifested throughout his ministry in, in speech and in deed and so on and so forth. That, but that's kind of the surprise, I think, of, of Jesus' baptism, that, of the, the coming of the Spirit. And again, we, I think, all want to know, like, was this a moment of, of, of um, insight for him? I mentioned the testing that comes just after this, not before this. I, I'm a year older now. I'm forgetting things. But um, anyway, you follow my point, right? It's, it's in this body of this person himself is going to be where that light's going to shine from and where the good news of God is going to become manifest. That's so I, I would, yeah, that's, I think the text asks us to start there, I guess, is my briefer point. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, think, 
Well, and other, I'm an old man. Let me just ramble. <laughs> the other, the other thing I thought about with this text uh, that, again, I hadn't really, you know, it's been three years since we've seen this text, and and, uh, but the connection to, the connection to baptism and and a fulfilling of righteousness, and the way in which righteousness. Uh, ends up being, if we think back to, uh, the, you know, Joseph was a righteous man, but being a righteous man and that uh, that faithfulness to accomplish God's purposes is part of what righteousness is. And so then I was thinking like how how baptism becomes a, you know, in my tradition, Lutheran tradition, we have a lot of talk about living out your baptismal identity, which most of the time I don't really know what that means. But th this really helped me because I thought, well, my baptismal identity is living in righteousness. It's, uh, it's still, it's a, it's a mark of that living in righteousness, a righteous, uh, uh, hopefully a right relationship with God. But how do I manifest or how do I manifest that righteousness, that obedience in my life? And so that, that, that recalling of, of a, of a connection, at least in Jesus eyes between fulfilling of righteousness and baptism was uh, also a helpful way for me to think about baptism a little bit differently this year. And there's, uh, if, um, if we take a look at the commentary, uh, there's uh, a recognition uh, that this isn't the first time that baptism, that this ritual of cleansing has meaning, it has context for them before Jesus' baptism. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's worth noting that, I think, especially in light of what, what you were just saying, Caroline. Um, but I also appreciated the recognition that um, coming to John for baptism and confession is a public act and that it wouldn't bode well for one's reputation, mm -hmm. um, the commentator says. And I think that's another way to think of it is um, I, I did a confirmation class um, um, when I was uh, largely a youth pastor and uh, the, the, the kids in the class weren't they were getting baptized because it was on the calendar. And I challenged them to say, I know your grandparents are coming. I know your parents have bought you new suits and dresses for this. Um, but baptism is about more than just this ceremony in the church. Are you willing to make this confession of faith and make this commitment um, that will change your reputation in the world? Mm -hmm. And to a kid, they all said they weren't ready to make that. And I got in trouble with the senior pastor because I said, um, we're not gonna do confirmation on schedule because the kids have said they don't wanna do it because it's scheduled. They wanna do it when it's the confession of their faith. And I, I caught, you know, I got in trouble for that, but it's really interesting to think of do we bring that to people today? Um, is this just a ceremony for a dinner and new clothes and, you know, to have everybody see the new baby? Or are we really making a promise to be a people um, who will show the world what the presence of God looks like in an invitational way um, that, as you said, Caroline, is a practice of righteousness. Mm. Mm -hmm. Okay, there was my rambling, uh, Matt, so. <laughs> it's all good to me. Uh, Isaiah? Do we, do we wanna move to Isaiah? Yeah. Yeah. And here's where I landed with Isaiah. Obviously you have the, the connections. Uh, I put my spirit upon him, he will bring forth justice. Uh, you have, uh, I have called you in righteousness. I have taken by the hand and kept you. So it's just, you know, it's all, all the, well, not all, but many of the themes that we've already talked about are there and the connections with, uh, with Matthew's version of Jesus baptism that we have, uh, that we have in Isaiah text. But here's what I would do with this. Maybe not preach on it, but you could preach on it in a way that Again, through the lens of what, you know, when you, when you were talking, Joy, I was thinking about like, what, 
what do people think about when they when they watch a baptism? You know, what do they think about their own baptism? Do they uh, do they do they have any kind of imagination of how baptism has an effect on their lives now when it happened? Who knows how many years ago? And I uh, and and yeah, and what kind of what kind of uh, thoughts do they have about it? Anyway, so I was thinking with the Isaiah text is that this is like an expansion of this is my son in whom I am pleased. Like these, this is, this is what's behind and around and even forward in that one phrase that, that if you can imagine God saying to you, you are my child with whom I am well pleased. You are my servant who I uphold, my chosen and whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit on you and you will bring forth justice to the nations. That's how I would use the Isaiah text is that these are God's words to you uh, when you are, when you, when you get baptized. Anyway, that's my thought. I, I, I appreciate that. Um, following what I said in terms of not being judgmental and you know that for uh for john jesus coming to him for baptism was like no wait a minute i need to come to you um really fits with this isaiah text because if we've used baptism as a way of judging folks did you get wet did you get wet right sprinkled immersion, you know, um, we, we have all kinds of divisive ways to talk about baptism. And this Isaiah text includes in those acts of righteousness that the wounded will not be made worse. Or as the text actually reads, a bruised reed he will not break and a dimly burning brick wick he will not quench. And that's what this bringing forth justice looks like. It's not divisive. It's not judgmental. It is life-giving. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I really appreciate um, your using these words uh, in this way, um, Caroline, for God's words to us in our baptism, mm -hmm. but also to see that it doesn't make us better than. Mm -hmm. In fact, it calls us to recognize that the others who are siblings with us in Christ. Yeah, you know, there's so many there's so many texts from the scriptures that like the early church could have chosen <laughs> to help them interpret who Jesus was. Like once they're convinced that he's the Messiah, how they go back to scripture to find language to to root that messianic identity in God's bigger plan. And this is just a really interesting text in terms of what the servant of the Lord is going to do and how the servant of the Lord is going to conduct himself, mm -hmm. um, which again goes back to the, the idea of what does it mean for Jesus to bear the spirit of God in his own, his own baptism? Like, what is that going to look like? That could be a terrifying thing to imagine mm -hmm. yeah. um, God's designated one, you know, empowered by the spirit of the Lord to wreak all sorts of havoc, right? And and that this is, you know, looking at Christ through the lens of who he was, death, resurrection, and so on. This becomes a way of saying, but yeah, this is what that spirit will will do. And just to kind of help people imagine the redefinition that's going on here. Mm -hmm. Back in Advent, when we looked at John's preaching, one of the things we talked about was how John is is urging people to pick a side or letting people know that there's going to be division coming soon and some of that th those binaries are, are make us uncomfortable because it appears there's only the saved or the damned or the you know the sheep or the goats there's nothing in between but, but this is an interesting kind of conclusion to john's preaching that the one who comes now is going to bear the spirit of god and again his next act will be to go off in the wilderness to encounter uh, the devil uh face to face person to person you know, what is, how does that spirit, which is the same spirit, which with we are possessed, filled, continue to act out in this particular mm -hmm. kind of way, you know, is maybe that's, and Corey Driver says this in his commentary on Isaiah 42, maybe this is what a baptismal identity is, Caroline, that it's, 
it's finally about what does it mean to model your life after Christ's own life and Christ's mm-hmm. own pattern and Christ's way of dealing with the, the brokenness of this world. Yeah. Yeah. Being righteousness. Yeah. As mm-hmm. opposed to like claiming a side, right. Or claiming a, but I'm yeah. sure it means many things. Yeah. And yeah. if, if I, if I push us into just the, the words of the Psalm, um, which uh, I'd probably follow Caroline's usual lead in lo- using the psalm. I don't know if this is how you would do it this time, but would you use it? Liturgically? You know? <laughs> yeah, I was going to ask that. <laughs> um, but um, the if in uh, last week you made reference to Herod having the power and then abusing um, and needing... Um, and being threatened when the that when this baby is ascribed that's the word I want to use from the psalm uh, ascribe glory ascribe strength um, ascribe power um, if 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 you've used that last week then there might be a way of acknowledging that too where um, as as Matt was just pointing to when we get away from the divisions and the binary of the way that we've talked about baptism and it becomes our responsibility to be the hope, then it's not ascribing power to us because I've been baptized or ascribing strength to us because I'm part of this community, but it's others ascribing glory and strength to God because in us they experience justice and they experience yeah. righteousness. Mm-hmm. And that becomes a whole new way to recognize what it means to live in this identity as the baptized. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think with the psalm... I don't, I don't know, know if anybody wants to say anything week. else about the psalm. <laughs> I, I like what you suggested, Joy. I Maybe jump to uh, <laughs> Acts. Well, I'll just say, I'll say one thing, that my immediate connection was the way in which this psalm gets heard with the voice from heaven. Uh, this oh. is my son. And then the, the the voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The, the Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. I mean, the voice of the Lord flashes forth flames of fire, shakes the wilderness. I mean, so if you think that, the, you know, the voice of the Lord in the Matthew text sounds, uh, it, 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 it sounds lovely and nice. And, and you know, this is my son with whom I'm well pleased, but then you hear it with this Psalm and it's like, whoa, the voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord does stuff. And so that, that this is, this is my son with whom I am pleased, uh, is not, not just a, a claim of Jesus it's not, a, how do I want to say this? It's not just this like abstract claim of Jesus identity or that, like this is who he is, but actually makes him to be so. And, uh, and the, the, the majesty and the, and the power and the, of God's, uh, God's voice of holy splendor is behind that. And that, I don't know, that was just, it was something that I hadn't really thought about before. I, I appreciate that. I had neither the performative nature yes. of God's speech. Yes. God says, let there be, and there is. Yeah. God says, you are, and, you and are. this is who you are. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I love that. I yeah. Love that. So that's what I was thinking. And if, yeah, I love that. And if, um, if we think of that strength and that power and the performative nature of what God's word can do, mm-hmm. um, then these words and acts from Peter are also in the same vein that I've been speaking uh, today, um, that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, those who submit to God are found acceptable in him. So mm-hmm. the capacity using the Isaiah text um, uh, to bruise is not the power that he chooses to use. Mm-hmm. And so that partiality in this case, is a partiality to extend hospitality, to invite in. Um, and so our task is to be witnesses 
to this grace of God um, and testify um, uh, to this goodness of God who names us. Um, and I should add, in the reality of the power of God that you've just reminded us of, Caroline, saying that God doesn't show partiality also means that God's people are not, um, um, their shortcomings will not be ignored, mm. which is what um, the prophets, particularly the prophets of the Old Testament were pointing out. Israel will be judged for being, for not being faithful, for not showing hospitality. Um, so the, that part, par no partiality works in both ways. Mm. I want to thank the lectionary committee for giving us an Acts text on my birthday, which makes me feel, it makes me feel seen. I like that. Um, you are seen, deeply seen. Is, <laughs> um, we see you. You know this. You sermon, matter. I feel it. Uh, you know this sermon is is the one in Acts that tries to encapsulate everything Jesus did into just a couple of verses. Um, and it's almost as if it's pro forma because God's going to send the spirit anyway. Peter just has to say something. But but I do appreciate how the sermon, and this is, of course, why it's chosen for today. It, it launches everything with um, the baptism and God anointing Jesus with the Holy Spirit and with power. So I mean, what is the baptism of the Lord about, quote unquote? Um, it's about the spirit. It's about the spirit um, propelling Jesus into ministry. What he does, this is verse 38, that really, really brief description, doing good, healing all who were oppressed by the devil and God with him. In a way that's living out Isaiah 42, one through nine. I mean, that I'm taking some homiletical liberties there. But how this just keeps driving us back to the way in which what God does through Christ is empowered by the spirit. But that also means that it's happening again through his own body, through his own self and through a lived life. That it's not coming through the strength of a message, the strength of an army, you know, through the strength of some kind of supernatural, you know, inexplicable something or other. It comes through a body. It comes through a person. And that I think is at least, <laughs> and that's what the baptism of Jesus means to me. Mm. Ladies and gentlemen, mm. God bless us, everyone. <laughs>